Okay, as Will said, we're not going to have a break. Uh, move around and do what you need to do, but I'm going to go ahead and get started in the inter interest of time, um, introducing my panel and getting us started. This panel is going to have a slightly different flow. Um, we're going to begin with two um, plenary speakers. First will be Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, Sue Gordon, and then we will hear from the Commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, General Tony Thomas, on our response to the threats that Sue's going to tell us about. And then our two distinguished speakers will be joined by two former commanders of U.S. Special Operations Command, Admiral Eric Olson and Admiral McRaven. Um, as previous moderators have noted, you have the bios in front of you, and so we're going to move pretty quickly. But let me begin by introducing uh, Admiral Eric Olson. Admiral Olson was the eighth commander of the U.S. Special Operations Command, and this culminated a 38-year career in which he commanded at, at every level. He's a highly decorated officer. He's an inspired and an inspiring leader. And uh, we have something in common that we're going to be watching a football game next week, but we won't be pulling for the, the same side, I don't think. Um, our next panel member, Admiral McRaven, needs very little introduction at the University of Texas. He's our former chancellor, former commander of U.S. Special Operations Command. And even a brief summary of his, his accomplishments would, would take a while, and they're in your bio packs. But I do just want to make one special shout-out to you, sir, and that is your support to these programs and the national security programs at the University of Texas. And I just don't think we would be where we are without your support. <laughs> and Pam wanted me to thank you that I make my bed occasionally. Um, <laughs> And I've asked Admiral McRaven if he would introduce his old friend, General Thomas, when it comes to General Thomas's time to, to speak. So now it's my distinct privilege to introduce the Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence, the Honorable Sue Gordon. Uh, Ms. Gordon's had an extraordinary career, you should read it, which consistently put her at the cutting edge of innovation and adaptation. The very kind of challenges that we were just hearing about is what she has spent her career doing. She's held positions in all four directorates of the Central Intelligence Agency, and I think a lot of the groundwork that she did enabled to stand up the fifth directorate, the Directorate for Digital Innovation. Prior to her current job, she served as the Deputy Director of the National Geospatial Agency. From personal observation, I know her to be not only brilliant and fiercely committed to the mission, but a people person, a defender of the IC's people, and a positive and inspiring colleague. You know, with all these accomplishments, and I worked with Sue a lot, Somehow, I never knew you were the captain of the Duke basketball team. Yeah. <laughs> and when I read that, I thought, okay, this is not a real bio. This is, <laughs> this is uh, something that a fiction writer wrote, except it's not realistic. Um, no, Sue's had an amazing career, and she's raised two adult human people who are serving their country and are responsible citizens. I don't know how you did all that, Sue. But we are particularly excited to have you here today with us to talk about the threat, and then we will talk about the response to the threat with General Thomas. Welcome, Sue Gordon. Actually, what my friend Paul said was that I'm old, lucky, and grateful. Um, I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, I was honored at the invitation and daunted by it at the same time to... Uh, follow Senator Sass and his remarks to get the chance to sit on a panel with these luminaries, not only my friends, but uh, in many cases my idols, and to be in front of you all who um, are practitioners of national security, each in your own domain, is quite an honor. Uh, I represent the intelligence community. Um, I characterize what we do in intelligence is to know the truth, see beyond the horizon, and allow leaders to act before events dictate. I don't think there is anything about that that is going to become passe. Can you imagine a future where we don't need that? I cannot. Can you imagine how difficult those three things are today? It's hard to imagine. So the whole of the conversation as you're listening to it, think about those things, knowing the truth. Limiting the ability to missee things. See beyond the horizon, how in the world, when the horizon is increasingly digital, are we going to provide that clarity? And to provide the ability to act before events dictate, have such clarity and precision in what we do, and so know the policy construct that we're trying to perceive that we can provide something useful. That's the whole of what we're trying to do. 
I'm going to do a quick romp around the world in terms of threats. Senator Sass did such a good job, I won't take as much time as I might have before uh, to do that. And with his speed round of recommendations, I would say yes, yes, no, maybe, absolutely not, could be, let's work on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so here are a couple of points I want to, before I go to my romp around the world. Um, I don't think I'm a narcissist, but I'm quite confident in saying this is the most different world I've ever seen. I think, it's, I think it's changed. I think it's such a world that our ability to draft off the work of our predecessors is exceptionally limited. And whether it is a, from a policy perspective, from a capability perspective, from an intelligence perspective, from an understanding, we are going to have to create where once we could evolve. It is that different. And are we constructed to be able to create anew? Because that's what it will take. The second thing is the digital interconnected as the world is changing in ways that I can't imagine. Um, boundaries are almost meaningless. Not only geographic boundaries, but organizational boundaries. Boundaries within the systems. Not only boundaries that are inadvertently constructed, but boundaries we believe in. Boundaries between the government and the private sector. Boundaries between federal and state and local. But those boundaries mean something to us, but not to a digital domain and not to adversaries who would apply it. The digital interconnectedness is changing the aspiration of our adversaries. It isn't the ground next to you. You can have bigger aspirations. You have greater reach. And the speed with which information moves means that capabilities combined with those aspirations are emerging in ways that are different from the way they emerged even a minute ago. And we're going to have to deal with that. And data, um, some, I, I can't remember who said data is the new oil. New oil. What, I will, what I will tell you is data is both our bane and our boon. Data has the potential to have the answers to every question we have if we could command it. And it is also drowning us. Nate Silver in his book, The Signal and the Noise, said the problem is in this world, if we don't have the ability to understand the story, noise will look like data. So how are we going to see the story in this world's changing? And that is our collective challenge. That is the foundation of national security. And I will opine that is the foundation of what Senator Sass was saying we needed to take on is how we're going to do that. OK, quick romp around the world. Um, what's so interesting is even whew, five years ago, I don't think we would be talking about the great power competition that we're talking now. I don't think we saw, we saw Russia as relatively weakened, not economically sound, and just not developing the capabilities that we have. China, we just didn't see the extent of their national aspiration. We saw the economic competitiveness, but we didn't see the national advantage that they're trying to pursue in the same way. And so it's interesting just how quickly that has changed. But if you look at it, so let's start with Russia. Let's just look at, at not only its investment in military capabilities that are quite impressive, not only its geographic expansionism, uh, evidenced by what they're doing in Syria, which, interestingly enough, is not just about being in the Middle East. It is also about getting operational experience that will totally change their ability to understand how they are going to fight wars in the future. The brazenness of their activities what they're doing in cyber. Five years ago, I would have said, I am confident that Russia is capable from a cyber perspective, but I can't see them. And China would say, oh my gosh, they're everywhere, but they're massively ham-handed. Today, what I would say is Russia's cyber activities are incredibly overt. We see them. We see their presence. We see their presence on our infrastructure. We see their presence in their influence campaigns. And China has actually receded some, so they are much more difficult to see. China, we've talked a lot about it in all the panels. I won't go into it. But I will say it's the whole of country approach. It is the investment in their making in the military, but their movement across the world, geographically and economically, insinuating themselves into society, and fundamentally achieving the kind of power projection capability that once was exclusively ours. And that's on the terrestrial Earth. If you look at what they're doing in space in order to be able to support that, six years ago, they maybe had 10 satellites on orbit. Now they have the second most 
to the United States, hundreds going forward. Iran is clearly um, one of the most malign uh, nations and supporters, uh, state sponsors of terrorism. And what they do in terms of supporting others and being a proxy, proxy uh, force in Yemen, in Syria, is incredibly challenging. Syria, what Assad has done through his atrocities has created a venue and a vacuum that others are going to be able to move into, whether it's Russia or Turkey or Iran, and had the ability to create the kind of mischief that will deter demand response. CT isn't going away. Um, I think uh, looking at the gentleman that I'm going to get to ch say the ch stage with, you would have to say one of the greatest accomplishments of the past 17 years for the United States is what has been done in terms of countering terrorist threats. I remember that day. I remember what we thought was going to follow. And even though we've had to fight great fights, even though so many of our people and so many of our partners' people have been lost in this fight, if you look at what we've actually been able to protect strategically because of that fight, it has been remarkable. But for all those advances, for all the things we've done in terms of eliminating threats from geographic areas, this is a resilient threat. It's present in Africa and Asia. It's present in homegrown violent extremism. It is something that we're going to have to fight, but fight differently than we did before. Transnational organized crime, illicit drugs. 72,000 Americans last year lost their lives to overdoses of drugs. Let me put that in context. That's a 767 going down every day. Imagine if one went down today. Think about what the news would be of that horrific loss of life. And illicit drugs, drug overdose, 72,000 Americans last year. And what's behind that and what it allows and what it inspires. And when you think about the instruments of our adversaries' power and the kinds of things they can do, you have to put that into, take that into account. And then humanitarian crisis, whether environmentally caused or human-made uh, um, events, they are the sorts of things that create the disenfranchisement and the disbelief in our systems that allow extremism and terrorism to prosper. We don't talk a lot, I don't talk a lot about cyber threats independently anymore. We used to talk about it when we think about it from a technological perspective. Let me tell you the way I view cyber. It is the vehicle by which every instrument of national interest is going to be affected. Whether that is what Russia does, which is fundamentally determined to undermine the very democratic bases of society, it uses cyber to do that. If it's China wanting economic advance, cyber is the vehicle to do that, if it's criminal outreach. And so one of the things I would say is when we think about what we are going to do about cyber threats, it isn't just a technological issue. It is a vehicle by which national interest. So you have to understand intent. Yes, there will have to be responses, and this is something that is going to have to be fought every day. But it isn't a technological fight. It's a fight of interests, the same interests that we've known, but interests that are enabled, as I said before, by reach and distance. This data thing, it's a big deal. Um, whether it's Putin or whether it's Xi or whether it's me, the person who is going to, the, the nation that is able to command data for its purpose are going to have tremendous advantage. But those same things that allow that advantage can be incredibly misused. And so how are we as a collective going to be able to both advance the capability to use and protect from the misuse? To be able to put data into and technology into use so that we can respond at speed but protect ourselves from being duped.
This leads me to my last point. The greatest advantage we can have is in partnership. We learned this from counterterrorism. That was a fight of partners. If the cyber community could learn partnership and community in the same way the counterterrorism did, we'd be better off than we are today. But the partnership we need to have is with our international partners. It is with our private sector partners. It is with governmental partners that don't happen to be in the same branch. This is a time where we have to be able to share information appropriately, protect it appropriately, be able to see threats clearly, be able to demonstrate the impact and our confidence. This is going to be a data game, but it's a data game that is going to have to have confidence and truth behind it. Here's my challenge to you all before I leave it to the panel. Understand that national security is a team quest. When you hear national security, you don't think government. The great element of national security, of our national strength is what? It's the innovation and the capability of the private sector and the American people. It is that advance. That is part of it. That is part of what we have to protect. How is the government going to help that? And how is the private sector going to learn to understand that they are part of this great fabric? The intelligence community is more committed than I have ever seen us in sharing our best information with the people who need it to make their own decisions, not just be told what our decisions are. But that's a shared quest against the backdrop of the threats we feel with the confidence that I have, like Senator Sasses, that we have Tremendous advantage, great home field, but we have to work together in order to protect it against adversaries who see what we have and want it with the capabilities out there to do it if we don't run. Thanks very much. I look forward to talking to you on the panel. Thanks very much, Sue. First, uh, let me extend my thanks again to Will and Bobby and Steve. You guys really have expanded this program in a way that is just remarkable, and, and I thanks for all your work. Before I introduce Tony Thomas, let me also recognize Marilyn Olson and Barb Thomas, who are with us today. I will tell you, the three of us that became the commanders of U.S. Special Operations Command could not have gotten there without the strength of our ladies. Ladies, thank you so very, very much for standing behind us. You can read uh, Tony, Th Tony Thomas's bio, but, uh, but I wanted to tell you, what does it take to become the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command? I think in this day and age, one of the first and foremost things is you have to have combat experience. You look at Tony's bio, he graduated from West Point in 1980. By 1983, he is parachuting into Grenada. 1989, he's part of the invasion of Panama to unseat Manuel Noriega. Between 89 and 2011, he is with the Rangers and the Delta Force. He is the only man ever to have commanded a Ranger Battalion and a Delta Force Squadron. Since 9-11, every year since 9-11, 17 years, Tony Thomas has been downrange in Iraq or Afghanistan fighting the war. I would offer that no man that ever sat in the seat of U.S. Special Operations Command ever had more combat experience or was more qualified than Tony Thomas. The second thing is you have to have earned the respect of the troops. People often think that it's the officers or the generals that make you a general. That's just not the case. It's the troops that make you a general. Because if the troops don't follow you, if the troops don't believe in you, if you haven't lived up to their moral expectations, their ethical expectations, their legal expectations, they won't be there for you. And if they're not there for you, you won't accomplish the mission, and therefore you won't get promoted. Every soldier, sailor, airman, and marine that ever worked for Tony Thomas has learned to respect him, and I would offer to love him. And finally, you have to be trustworthy. If the President of the United States doesn't trust you, if the, if the Secretary of Defense doesn't trust you, if the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff don't trust you, if your leaders don't trust you, then you will never be able to lead. So for me, there's always a litmus test. And you often say, well, do you trust them with your life? That's easy. The question is, 
Would you trust your family? Would you trust Tony Thomas with your family's life? There are only a handful of people, I think, that I would trust with my family's life. Interestingly enough, there are a couple of them that are here today. I would trust Tony Thomas with my family's life. So when you think of that as a litmus test, frankly, there is no better person to be leading the U.S. Special Operations Command than Tony Thomas. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Tony Thomas. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I've relearned the lesson of the advantage of being here early so that you actually know, knew what preceded you. So I've tailored my comments uh, significantly, having been informed and enlightened by the uh, preceding discussions. Uh, interestingly, the three senators who are up here initially, I usually see them from the other side of a pulpit when I'm getting grilled. That's always fun. I have to look forward to that again here this, this coming February, but uh, I was very impressed with their insights. Certainly, Senator Sass's uh, commentary, uh, thought-provoking, is probably the understatement of the year, uh, but a comprehensive tour de force of things that apply uh, to this panel. Uh, and at the uh, risk of sounding like the Mutual Adulation Society, uh, thanks for the opportunity to follow Sue Gordon up here. Uh, she and I were actually teammates uh, at the CIA. One of the many anomalies of my career, I was, I was a card-carrying CIA uh, member. I'm proud of that fact. Um, I'm, I don't have the shakes anymore, but I... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I had a phenomenal, insightful year there at the agency, and Sue uh, was a teammate who I was uh, very, very close to, and, and was just a, it was a great experience. Uh, but I would also offer to you what, what you may or may not know about her, and, and some have attempted to describe uh, this irresistible character, but in, in one small bundle, uh, you have an incredible intellect, an extraordinary teammate, somebody who works to be a teammate, uh, and someone who's a catalyst for change. So we're very lucky, Sue, to have you there at the DNI, and, and I sleep soundly at night knowing you're there. <clears throat> I want to thank my friend and mentor, Bill McRaven, for inviting me here today. I would not be where I am uh, professionally uh, or otherwise, but uh, this was a great opportunity to come think uh, and come really reflect on, on our profession. So, uh, Bill, thanks for doing that. Although I have a confession right up front, I did not make my bed this morning. Um, <laughs> But I have an excuse, and I've thought all day, this has really bothered me, that I, you know, it's almost heretical, right? Uh, you know, he's, he's kind of made, his, it's been stock and trade. Uh, the reason I didn't make my bed this morning, Barb was still in the bed, so I, I, it would have been would have a little bit awkward, but I, I, I'm, I've gotten over that, and, and I hope it doesn't derail our discussions. Hey, I was given the, uh, the task to bridge from Sue's comments, uh, from the description of the strategic environment, to maybe tee out some ways we can get at it, to embrace it, and then uh, we'll follow up with a panel where we'll have a chance to interact with you. So that's what I'm endeavoring to do. We'll see if, uh, we'll see if I can actually get there. First, if I can amplify on some of Sue's observations, the situation might even be more complex than she described. There is, in fact, a bad trend for some of the adversaries she cited to actually work together in league against us, their shared threat, the United States. Specifically, Russia and China have recently demonstrated historic levels of cooperation in a broad range of activities. This is hardly natural, as we hearken back to the days of the Sino-Soviet split, but it is the current reality. The Russians and Iranians are strange bedfellows in that uber-complex environment of, of Syria, which Sue cited. Syria, I would offer, may be the living laboratory serving as the bridge between the historic counter-terrorist effort against violent extremists and both the peer and rogue threats cited in the national defense strategy in the form of Russia and Iran. The only thing missing there is China. Why do I say that? Where I was recently in Syria, within mortar or artillery range of our special operations forces, were Syrian regime, Russian regular forces, Russian paramilitary forces, Iranian Revolutionary Guards, uh, Guard Corps, uh, AKA IRGC, Lebanese Hezbollah, Shia militia groups, Turks and their surrogates, the coalition and our surrogates, and of course the remnants of ISIS. In the same battle space, we also have active combat between Israel and Iran layered over the top. Indescribably complex. And just for added flavor, we, just in we include some old school ingredients of active electronic warfare, sophisticated air defense, and occasional chem chemical weapons use. Our folks are thriving on that frontier. Besides acknowledging threat, I think it's worthwhile to consider how we got here. And this is shared across our security and diplomatic organizations, so I'll, I'll make the same commentary as some of our presidents. I'm not laying blame here as much to advertise how I think we got here and where I think we can actually learn from that and move forward. I think we can attribute our current situation to four primary reasons. Lack of strategy, failure to terminate conflict, intelligence failures, and wishful diplomacy. 
Lack of strategy. Let me unpack a couple of these. In 2016, then General Mattis and George Shultz soberly assessed in their blueprint for American security that the United States had largely operated unguided by strategy for the past 20 years across a couple of administrations. In an effort to address that, the newest national defense strategy provides our nation with clear strategic guidance. The NDS acknowledges and prioritizes the reemergence of peer threats of China and Russia. You've heard that today on several occasions. Secondly, it re recognizes rogue states, North Korea and Iran. And lastly, it highlights the continuing threat of violent extremist organizations, or VEOs, and future threats, including state and non-state threat actors. I had the opportunity to attend the McCain Security Forum a couple months past. He was not there, obviously, for, uh, as he was in his terminal days. But I had the opportunity to see the then prospective Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. In fact, at one point in his Q&A, he was uh, teed up with the gotcha question of, what drives our foreign policy? Is it national objectives or our national values? And I thought, boy, had, I, I, I was fumbling if I'd had to answer that question. Of course, I was middling in my 900-person class at West Point. He was number one, so he had a ready answer. And he said, both. And then very expertly explained that, that one, our national, our national interests are grounded in pragmatic, practical aspects of realpolitik. And the other, arguably more difficult art form, our national values, based upon our unique ethos, and the still strong demand for American leadership in challenging situations is unavoidable. It's a blend. It's an art form. I would offer, too, that there's been an ignorance or a misperception of other people's strategic, uh, strategic approach to life, specifically, as cited earlier, the Chinese. China has a clearly stated strategy. It's out. It's open. It's available. Uh, that they are actively pursuing, and it doesn't entail playing second fiddle to the United States of America in the future. Failure to finish. Uh, my my uh, introduction to Korea many years ago uh, with, with our South Korean counterparts usually evolved around a discussion that 75 year, at a 75-year armistice is not a natural state of affairs between two countries. There is an odd state of reconciliation ongoing right now that is preceding potential denuclearization, but that's 75 years in the making. After approaching an unprecedented level of brinksmanship this time last year, we're now in the throes of hopeful discussions, but with no real progress towards our stated objective of a denuclearized North Korea. History will reflect the fact that we won the Cold War back in 1989, but the recent resurgence of Russia begs the question, did we finish it effectively? Intelligence failures. Again, I, I'm a producer and a consumer of intelligence, so this is shared blame. We have never failed to get the next war or the threat wrong. Or too late, and we certainly didn't anticipate the quick turn to North Korean nuclear capability. A year ago, I would joke, because you try to make light of pretty, pretty dire things, that the North Koreans could only reach Topeka and they couldn't reach where I lived in Tampa. That changed with their high apogee test at the end of last year. What I hope to do is provide some ideas on how we might adapt to this new threat situation, and these are my opinions, informed by and hopefully in line with the department and my boss, who continually advises us military leaders not to get ahead of policy. The reality is, in my line of work in special operations, we often live at the leading edge of policy with the general guidance of, quote, buy space and time while developing the broadest possible options for policymakers and the commander in chief. It's an uneasy place to exist, but one where we thrive. To give you an example of that delicate existence, let me cite again Syria. In 2014, I was in command of a different organization, and we woke up the emergence of ISIS as a heinous extremist threat with a global reach and audience. Our four policy objectives that I inherited as a tactical commander, which are still consistent today over a change of administration, are one, defeat ISIS. Secretary Mattis came on and changed that to annihilate ISIS. That's not, that's not a doctrinal term, but it was pretty much giddy up, get after this thing. <laughs> Second one was avoid war with Russia. The third was disrupt Iranian hegemonic activities. And the last was avoid a Turk-Kurd tete-a-tete. We are on the verge of concluding military operations against ISIS although we have some work left to be done, but we continue to be challenged in the other three policy objective areas every day. So what to do, what to do about these challenges? The default is to discuss, in, especially in my line of work in the military, is to discuss the potential for conflict. We automatically go to phase three, brute force contact, almost invariably, where, where the military must be prepared for a, a, a war, although none of us want that eventuality, neither our adversaries nor we. This has actually reinvigorated an old theme with a new title, competition short of conflict, although the cursory analysis on competition short of conflict usually evolves to four elements of power, diplomatic, information, military, and economic, of big D, big I, big E, little M. 
Think of the acronym that's left over there, by the way, a big D, big I, big E, before you consider a little M. But a failure in that competition, short of conflict, goes to big M in a hurry, and it's only a cursory look at, at the challenge, and really reminds us of the essence of deterrence. So how do we adapt and adjust for this new and challenging environment? I'd offer the first critical step is to acknowledge the one attribute that all these threats share, the fact that they are global, and the need, therefore, to tr forge truly global solutions. I believe some of the tenets of a successful approach are global, and that includes task organization changes across the interagency, delegated authorities, decisive information operations, you've heard that theme up here a few times today, and partnered activities specifically but not exclusively based on information sharing like we've never done before. In a global conflict, no one country, even us, has the capacity to do it, all, do it alone. Allies and partners are key and essential, which means we must be willing to share information and empower them like never before. Already that trend, in our, is, that trend is already uh, ongoing in our national intelligence uh, authority, and Sue, I want to thank you and the director for that. Every day we're unlocking new doors to empower our allies, and it is the coin of the realm. It's as powerful as actually being out there in the field with them. Reassurance of allies takes on a whole new substantive meaning with this kind of approach, but plays to the one consistent theme I hear everywhere I go in the world, and that's the criticality of U.S. leadership. Literally, I'll have allies begging us to stay. Don't care about the, whatever the overall architecture, you, U.S., please stay with us, please continue to lead. Task organization, we talked about this briefly, but a cursory glance at our U.S. security organization will highlight a geographically restricted approach to the challenge, geographically, emphasis on geography, not threat, not function. Our IC, our intelligence community, our State Department, and our DOD are all arranged with a geographically restricted focus as opposed to a truly globally integrated effort. The DOD specifically horse blankets the globe in a six-region approach. Our adversaries are not hobbled by similar arbitrary boundaries. In fact, they, they defy that approach every day. We may need to consider a corresponding threat-oriented functional approach to be as agile as the corresponding threat. There are, in fact, four global GCCs in the DOD inventory. Strategic Command, our nuclear deterrent. Cybercom, newly empowered, as, as the Senator mentioned, with, and moving out with brand new authorities. Transportation Command, which arguably makes it all happen. And Special Operations Command. We all operate in a global context, and we're working together more effectively than ever in attempting to provide blended global solutions to our security challenges. I'll actually have a warfighter with both John Hyten from Stratcom and Paul Nakasone from Cybercom at, at Tampa here after the turn of the year, uh, but we are working some pretty ingenious new global uh, solutions together for the, for the geographic commanders, for the interagency, which we haven't done before. Authorities. If we've learned anything from the preceding counterterrorist effort, it's, it's that authorities to act must be delegated at a level which really enables operations at the speed of rel relevance. And again, Senator Sass mentioned, the, or Sec Senator Sass mentioned the new cyber authorities. Uh, Cybercom is very enthusiastically embracing those. Information operations, and SOCOM's on the verge of being designated the DOD lead for messaging and countermessaging in uh, past this last year through legislation. Truth and legitimacy matters. Our adversaries don't conduct information warfare as much, as much as war on information, undercutting the legitimacy of all comers, including governments. Russia and, China, Russia and China are not peddling a platform of human rights and democratic values. We need to compete in this critical, some would offer decisive environment, all of which is wrapped up in a world of maybe the most revolutionary technological development we've known and which may in fact drive a revolution in the military application of technology the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence. Major corporations are already operating comfortably in this space, while our national security apparatus is moving along less aggressively, pondering the policy implications and the need for regulation. I read daily op-eds on the fearful trend towards Skynet. Meanwhile, our adversaries are pressing for any and all advantage. Culture change is often what's thrown back in my face, even in my organization, which prides itself in being, being agile, as something that seems insurmountable or something that you can push down the road. It's the major shift or something, again, that you can delay on. The need for change is now. But in my opinion, it's not as daunting as we're inclined to make it. The phenomenon's here and not futuristic. We need to embrace, especially us 60-year-olds, the need to educate and understand both the technology and the application. There is a gap. We need to acknowledge it affects and applies to everything we do. Don't constrain up front. It applies to everything unless proven otherwise. And if we apply it, it will, it will make us more effective. And then lastly, if that's not compelling enough for you, our adversaries are already going there with dangerous, dangerous uh, trends. 
tactically, and I didn't go to tactical and operation where I'm most comfortable initially, I tried to stay strategically, but tactically for SOCOM, that's applicable to everything from targeting, kinetic and non-kinetic targeting, information operations, personnel management, logistics, communications, you get it, everything we're doing. In the security arena, we have a tendency to be afraid of data, big or otherwise. Tendency, the tendency to be afraid because of our own vulnerabilities. We need to flip that paradigm in a hurry. Those are just some of my thoughts as we embrace the challenges of current and future world. As the commander of the United States Special Operations Command, I'm actually excited about what, what we might offer in terms of creative new ways to get after these challenges. While I admit to being exceedingly parochial, I state emphatically that we are not the panacea. So come, can't solve it all. I never said that, for the record. But as part of the joint force, I think we can and should provide unique solutions and approaches to all these problems. I think our special operations force is incredibly relevant to all of these threats, both the current threats of violent extremism, competition short of conflict, et cetera, and all the future threats that you can consider, aligned in and in support with our national security objectives. So thanks again for the opportunity to be here today. I believe we're now uh, segueing to a panel discussion where I'll join two of my predecessors and Sue to entertain your questions. Thank you. Miss Gordon has a uh, hard stop, so we're going to give, uh, we started a little late, but we're going to finish on time, so I just want to mention that as we go through this. Um, that was, uh, the, both um, your presentations and the presentations before were actually teeing up some of the things that we were going to talk about here with regard to threats. But I wanted to pick on uh, the very specific thing that you were talking about there at the end, General Thomas, but I wanted to start by asking the two previous commanders of SOCOM how they see the, the regional organization and whether it's adequate and appropriate for the current challenges, the way we've structured our commands and the way we structure our, our responses to these challenges. I'll start with Admiral Olson, maybe. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a little more historical in my viewpoint. Uh, with I was the commander four commanders ago. Two of the three since then are, are on the stage. Um, what we're talking about is the is the geographic combatant command network and how we have, as a department, divided the globe neatly into uh, into regions to be addressed by senior military commanders for military operations in that region. Uh, and and it generally works very okay. Uh, the, 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 the challenges, looking back on it now, are that, are that we don't have sufficient mechanisms in place to cross the borders of those regions with thought, uh, with capability, uh, in, a, in, a, in an agile way. And so, in a way, it's even considered an encroachment for one geographic combatant commander to be considering some sort of activity, some sort of policy that would affect another geographic uh, combatant commander. Uh, so that's point one. Point two is that as long as we, the Department of Defense, are, are carving the world into geographic regions, we probably ought to have the same regions. Uh, roughly, at least as the Department of State, as the intelligence community, and as other uh, elements of government. Bill? Yeah, the only thing I'd add is uh, I have always liked uh, most of the geographic combatant commanders in terms of how we have apportioned them because it is about relationships. I mean, at the end of the day, the geographic combatant commander gets to know each of the ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors, each of the heads of state, and those relationships are important. I was there when we separated and, and established Africa Command. So European Command had both Europe and Africa. And candidly, it was just too broad for the UCOM commander to be able to deal with, to be able to establish relationships with all the African countries. So when we established AFRICOM, uh, those relationships, I think, strengthened as a result of that. However, as Admiral Olson pointed out and, uh, and General Thomas did, there are some um, threats out there that are just not geographically contained. So I think having this blend of, yes, you need somebody that kind of owns terrain, that is there, working the relationships on a day-to-day -day basis, but you also have to recognize that there are going to be threats that will move very quickly from run, one geographic combatant commander to another, to another, to another, to, you know, our, our borders. And we've got to be able to have somebody that oversees that threat in a way that can coordinate it uh, quickly, rapidly, and effectively. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, General Thomas, I wanted to ask you to, if you could drill down a little bit on your vision for what you were talking about with, uh, with regard to the way we might organize certain problem for certain problems uh, differently, um, especially things like information warfare and, and issues like that. Right. Um, I, I was actually inspired to think about the problem uh, by some legislation that was pending uh, two years back w with the draft NDAA, where they were looking, you know, the, the, our, our Congress, the, the, the one that funds us, the one that resources uh, sense that we weren't as flexible as we needed to be and we're looking at different ways of, of sorting the problem. So they were looking at big headquarters as a, as a problem, you know, bureaucracy if, if you want to take it in that context. Uh, but they were also looking primarily at the agility of six geographic com combatant commands relative to global threats that aren't staying neatly in, their, in those, uh, those confines. Um, so it was pending and in fact what I usually have advised um, you know, my folks and, and folks who are inclined to listen is that we might want to devise our, our own structure or determine what the best way going forward is, or we'll ultimately we will have Congress telling us because they're onto it as well as, as, a, as a, a source of vulnerability for us. So it, the, the conversation should happen. I think the, the good news is, and I, I'll give John Hyten at Stratcom uh, the lion's share of the credit because he's a, a brilliant officer, is that uh, we're now more inclined to blend existing global combatant commands, our nuclear command, you know, pretty, pretty darn potent on a global scale, our cybercom pervades everything. SOCOM, I'm in most of the countries he talked about us being in, uh, in, in some way, shape, or form, and then our transportation command, but how you blend those global combatant commands with that kind of perspective, that kind of effect, across our geographic combat command constructs. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but for the current piece, figure out how we are both globally agile and, and regionally, kind of to, to Bill's point, uh, there in, in with, with, uh, with real presence, not virtual presence, uh, developing those relationships. Probably came home to me most uh, uh, poignantly recently when I was down in Panama, and the country team asked me to meet with uh, Presidente Varela. And uh, so I reached back to Kurt Tid, the Southcom commander, to say, this is your domain. I, I certainly want to interlope here. And he said, fine, please, please have the conversation with him because he's actually tired of hearing it from me. But it was about, it was about the nefarious influence of the Chinese buying out the Panama Canal Zone. They had also just flipped three countries relative to Taiwan down there. Um, that is not on the radar of the Indo-PACOM commander, what China is doing in Central and South America, although he is the coordinating authority for countering China. So that's the, the challenge we have currently. Uh, the good news is we in DOD are aggressively trying to rectify that, but we have an existing six regional structure and some globals, and we have to meld them much better in the future. So it's more of an integration thing than a reorganization? Is that what you're talking about? Or? It may require, I, I, I'd hate to constrain ourselves if a radical you reorganization. Rule out re radical I, I think we have to be as aggressive as our adversaries. China and Russia, uh, the, the, the level of their aggressives and the blend of their elements of power. So they're buying out the canal zone with economic power, which is paired directly with their military objectives. There is no bureaucracy in between. They don't have a whole bunch of policy wonks in between. They are, they're tight. I'm not, I'm not saying the upside of a, of a despot, but there are, there are advantages in terms of, of how they uh, coordinate their activities. Um, I wanted to shift to the IC for just a second and, and talk about not the threat so much as the IC response to the threat. Yeah. So how are we shifting resources? What are we, what are we doing there to, uh, to, to think about these new challenges differently? So we have a little bit of a running start at this. Um, so 9-11 highlighted the weaknesses of those 17, then at that point 16 organizations, much like in 1947, post Pearl Harbor, information tends to get stovepiped. So post 9-11, you formed basically the intelligence community. You made the 17th agency, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, with pretty much the singular function of integration. Um, and uh, due to my predecessors, we decided that we needed to be digitally integrated. And digital integration is actually a really fascinating, quick way to do reorganization. Because once you can share data, once you aren't constraining who can look at what data and can draw what conclusion, you actually are on your way to reorganizing. My friend Robert Cardillo, the head of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, so imagery, um, is really articulate on this. He said, yeah, what he, what he and Paul Nakasone at NSA do, do are very different. Paul Nakasone deals with ones and zeros, and he deals with zeros and ones. <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting about this is if you, if you take integration and you imagine that once the data can move without the constraints of ownership or fear of who gets to act on it, 
you actually get to some of the things you need. Now, we need to extend beyond that because this line of demarcation between strategic intelligence and tactical intelligence, you just can't have a world anymore where you do tasking to collector to processing to processing to dissemination to artificial analysis to someone in the field. You have to make that much, and technology will do that. But my, where the intelligence community is starting, because the cost of reorganization physically is time, is really in using data to affect that integration. And so you're just seeing that. I think things will come that will change, but that's really what you're doing. And so you just see our ability to move data, and that allows people to act on the data wherever they are. I wanted to ask a question about it's it's very easy for us to say that we are going to maintain vigilance on counterterrorism but then shift resources to other things. Mm -hmm. And I you know, I've I've been asked to do more with less before and sometimes we just yeah. said less with less. But um, I'm I'm wondering how we do that. Are there places where we actually can uh, take what we've learned and do it more efficiently? And then even when we if we if we do do that, you know, what's left is still a, a big mission. So I, I, I'll start with you, the current commander, but I want to hear from the previous commanders and, and the intel community because I think the counter, I personally am, uh, I want to make sure that we don't forget that it has been a long fight that, and, and sometimes it's a pretty close call. Yeah, the, the very blunt conversation we're having now, which is the conversation we have to have, um, is um, mostly resource-based, uh, but it's the extraordinary resources we've applied over 17 years uh, you heard the human capital today. I like, I like the fact that that was emphasized because all too often it's the trillions of dollars. The four people we lost this week are my people. Mm -hmm. um, they just got returned to Dover Air Force Base last night and returned to their families. That's been a 17-year struggle that most of America is not aware of, um, or they see it in blips and um, they ask why are we still there, but they really can't put any more context than that. But the hard discussion that's, that, that is bound with that is we've spent a lot of capital, both human and resource, that we can't sustain as a, as a country, trillions of dollars, and this is what it's returned on investment. Um, and the, so the hard, harder inside conversation is, what is sustainable security? What, where can you actually put something in place where you can sustain over the long haul that doesn't require extensive number of troops downrange, uh, gads of money that isn't sustainable? You're just throwing money after, you know, in, into a money pit and, and not actually going to result in... Uh, you know, a sustainable security situation. So that's that's the hard conversation in many countries. I won't say any specifically right now where we've been for years, but can you finish this? Can you actually park it in the garage? Or is there, and here's where the real challenge is, we're conflating nation-building costs with CT costs. I could offer a CT model that's pretty much less expensive. It's mowing the grass. It's keeping the threat at bay at distance, playing an aggressive away game by, with, and through partners. Um, that's not very satisfying. That doesn't necessarily get to the symptoms of the problem, but it isn't expensive nation-building efforts that, that really ask that hard question, can this stick? Can it stay? Um, and and uh, you know, God bless our diplomats to try and make it happen, but that's, that's probably the harder, the harder thing to accomplish. I would just ask Admiral uh, Olson and, and McRaven, what, from, from the standpoint of uh, uh, special ops, if they had a comment on that before we moved to Intel. Yeah, it's a, it's a rules and missions discussion. Uh, you know, special operations is a unique beast. Uh, General Petraeus used to call it both fish and fowl. It has global responsibilities. It's both an operational command and a resourcing command in terms of providing people and equipment mature capabilities to, uh, to other operational commanders. Uh, and, and the definition of a special operation is actually a negative or a reverse one. A special operation is one that other forces do not have the training organization or equipment to perform. And so that leaves everything else uh, to the special operations community if no one, if no one else is prepared to do it. And, and, so, uh, and so, so kind of become utility infielders with guns sometimes and utility infielders with, uh, with brains. But they're a problem-solving force. The people in it are older. Uh, they have volunteered more times and passed through more filters. Uh, then across the broader military, they tend to be more expeditionary in terms of deploying faster with smaller footprint, and so they become, in a sense, the easy button uh, to solve a lot of uh, a lot of problems that would not, sort of, in a thoughtful analysis, be a special operations mission where there more time or a strategy uh, that was different in, in in preparing the broader force. Um, 
And over time, the portion, the, the percentage of US military forces in the special operations community and the percentage of the budget dedicated to special operations forces hasn't changed that much. I mean, since 9-1-1, there's been a lot of focus on the special operations forces. But you do the math, and, and as a percent of DOD, uh, it's about, uh, it's not much different than it was uh, 15 years ago. When I was uh, in the Pentagon as a, a young lieutenant back in, uh, in 1986, we were building the maritime strategy. Again, this was the Cold War, and the maritime strategy was going to take the Navy to a 600-ship Navy. And there was this great debate going on in the Pentagon uh, with the planners at the time, the N5s, about are we going to build a maritime strategy based on the threat or based on capability? And, uh, and eventually, threat won out. So we were going to build a Navy to fight the Soviet Union. So the U.S. Navy invested heavily in fighting the Soviet Union. And then, of course, the wall falls, and all of that capability now has to be, has to be distributed more broadly. So in the special operations community, I think this is always our challenge as well. Uh, how do we balance? Do we build the force, to your point? How expensive is it going to be? Do we build it to the threat? Or do we have a broader capability that then can flex to whatever the current threat of the day might be? As all three commanders here know, this is a quarterly discussion that we have at U.S. Special Operations Command as you're going through the resourcing. Where do we put our resources? And are we resourcing for last year's fight? Or are we resourcing to what could potentially be tomorrow's fight? It is, I, we, and we'll never get it right. Uh, I think a couple of folks have said it, uh, you know, we're always kind of betting on what's the next war going to look like, and we're always wrong. So I've always felt after watching that as a young lieutenant, invest in capability and be prepared to reinvest when you have to focus on that particular threat. There's an old adage that the uh, special operations community can do anything, but it can't do everything. And uh, what the commanders struggle with every day is what it is they're not going to do. And by not doing it, does it leave a void in our yeah. national capability? Well, you know, this theme that you're describing now, if I could just interject before Sue responds, it, it harkens back to a question Steve asked about focus. How do we, you know, so, you know, what should we focus on? What keeps you up at night? Uh, nobody could really give a clear answer to that. And I think three different speakers have said, we don't actually know what our priorities are strategically. Sorry. So it's kind of hard to, to, for a derivative, you know, for, for lower commands to figure that out. That's also true for the IC. Yep. The other thing I think about the IC, both SOF and the IC, or sort of whenever we are resourcing, the, uh, you know, looking at hard resource choices, we look at the IC as sort of an economy of force. Like you're going to give us early warning about new problems so we can react in time. Yep. So that's another mission. Yep. So, uh, so, you know, what, uh, General Thomas mentioned uh, the new strategies we have, the national defense strategy, and there are subordinate strategies to that, uh, Iraq, CT, numbers of strategies. All of them have an intelligence element to them. All of those uh, intelligence elements of those strategies uh, so far outstrip our ability to provide all that intelligence within the resources we have. We are just constantly demanded more of with less resources. And it is really hard for me to decide to move resources from Russia to Iran or from China to transnational organized crime. There just isn't a mechanism that allows me to choose that. So that's kind of our challenge here. So what we're doing now is we're really focusing on those 16 agencies in the intelligence community. Do all 16 need to be doing the same thing? So how can I look at what all are doing on Russia or all are doing on North Korea? And does every agency need to have an intelligence assessment of Kim Jong-un's mental state, or can we do it? So, so our approach is really, no, 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 because when the world got more connected, when we were in a period of growth, every agency looking at the same world just went woof in terms of what could do. And now we have to find a way to look at it together to make some choices about do all of us need to do it. I've spent my life in technology, but, but what I mostly value is human thought. But I will tell you that one of the things we're going to have to do is we're going to have to get people out of manual tasks we have got to introduce artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to deal with more data with machines as partners so that my humans aren't hunting anymore. If we do not invest in that, 
We are not going to get there. So my third piece of solution to this is we have got to modernize how we deal with, look at data, and get my humans on the critical thinking pieces and use machines for what machines are good at. And so if I make this constant pitch about working with the private sector to get those technologies into our communities and into the department, it is simply because that is the only way we are going to be able, within the resources we have, have the knowledge we need to be able to share it. In, in, in that pursuit, if I'd offer, because I'm, I'm absolutely with you, um, we chased technology for the last bunch of years. So I'd go to Silicon Valley, I'd come to Austin, I'd go to Boston, I'd go to Carnegie Mellon. Mellon. You, know, you just can't, you can't put markers down everywhere you need to. The new trend is invite them into, uh, take the, accept the risk. Get, clear, get clearances through, your, your big challenge, get clearances yeah. through. Yeah, um, but get them in under the tent because they're brilliant people. And they'll literally start with what, are you what problem are you trying to solve? You're doing it in a pretty ham-fisted manner. You're doing it in a manner that we couldn't get away from a corporate corporate approach. Here's some interesting approaches, whether it's algorithms or what. But it's it's it, it's it's already we're we're already turning the corner. But we should have done it yeah. three, four, five years ago, like a lot of other companies did. Um, but we got to embrace it. And unfortunately, who, who fights or pushes back mostly against us are age-old analysts. Who you're, I'm going to lose a job. No, I'm going to save you yeah, for the exquisite an analysis that. The machine will set up for you. It's why they win Jeopardy. It's why they win chess. They, you know, they, they got all that down. You make the exquisite move at the end of it, um, that, but, and you don't give up trigger. It's not going to Skynet automatically unless you let it go there. <laughs> I want to get to the audience, but I have one more question that I can't resist asking, and you were actually just both of the last two speakers were kind of uh, teeing it up, and that is that I did some reckoning here, and if my calculations are right, not counting the academies and not counting service that happened after retirement, there's 156 years of service up here. That's a lot of time. Wow, we are. And since I'm in the young people business, um, I, I think I, I just wanted you to comment on how important it is that we attract great talent to these two missions and, uh, and that we have a continued uh, yearning for service by young people coming into the government on a regular basis. And I want to give the panel an opportunity to comment on that for our students here, many of whom are here including some from Texas A&M who came over. I, I, mean, I mean, clearly, um, although we may be returning to great power competition, the competition will be of an entirely different nature uh, than it was before. It takes an entirely different set of minds, a, a different set of imaginations and, and innovations and audacity. Uh, to approach it in a way that uh, that is, that is going to require, and, and and we hunger for the kind of talent that is represented at the back of the room, uh, in the back of the room here. It, it, this we are, as many speakers have said today, transitioning from you know to where 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 keyboards become the weapons and bytes are the bullets and. And, uh, and artificial intelligence, the, the military that rules artificial intelligence will have a significant advantage in all future conflict. The automation of the, of the battlefield is a real thing. Uh, the autonomous warrior is, is not that far uh, in the future as we have autonomous platforms uh, now. And, and so this, this idea of, it's not just it's not just bringing the youth in to learn from us. It's bringing the youth in so we can learn from them. And it's, a, it's an entirely different mindset that they bring uh, to, the, to the entirely new, I think, conflict environment. Yeah, I always uh, find it amusing. Uh, people ask me a lot, having been in the military and then in higher education, uh, about the millennials. And, uh, and I think my response always surprises them when I tell them that, I'm the biggest fan of the millennials you'll ever meet. I said, one, I have seen them on the battlefield and I've seen them in the classroom. And you know, sometimes when you take a look at what's happening in Washington, you look at uh, kind of what's happening globally, uh, it, it can cause you some anxiety. But I will tell you, uh, I don't worry about it because I've spent time around the you know, young men and women uh, of this nation. And they will be, the millennials in particular, and probably Gen Z, I mean, we'll call these kids you know, the greatest generation of this century. Um, and when people say, well, I, I think they're pampered, well, then you've never seen them, right. you know, fighting in a firefight in Kandahar. Uh, or, you, or you think they're entitled, well, then you've never seen them crossing the, uh, the bridge to, to go to school in El Paso. 
Um, I don't worry about this country because, again, I, I've been around these kids. We need to make sure they come in and, and want to be part of government service. And again, as I look around the, the classroom here today or the, the room today, it's great to see how many are, are going to be part of that. We need you. Uh, every one of our organizations needs you. Uh, and, and I appreciate your sacrifice and your willingness to do that. Um, so I couldn't agree more. Um, we're going to be okay as long as young people come. Period. For all the things that have been said throughout today, we're going to be okay. And let me tell you why you want to come. Uh, I said this, Jose, I can't, I don't know where you're sitting. I, it matters. What we do matters. The best thing about service to the nation is because you'll have better chance to have more responsibility early. And regardless of what you tend to do, we're going to do later, that will serve you on your way. And the chance to pursue great purpose, because it really is the combination of quest and capability. You will be well served as well as we will be well served. And we'll all be OK as long as you keep coming. I've had an opportunity to go back to my alma mater over the last couple of years. You know, they've asked me. Um, and consistently, every time I go back and talk to the first classmen at West Point, uh, their biggest complaint is this, this newest class is the weakest class ever. <laughs> and, um, and so I've kind of made a shtick out of that. And so I, I knew they were going to say that to me this last year up there, and I said, this is nothing new. In fact, a recent poll indicated, of America's youth indicated that they are callow, cowardly, self-serving, and leftist leaning. Oh, I forgot to mention that poll was done in November of 1940 about the greatest generation as, as captured in an army at dawn by Rick Atkinson. So I, pl I play this back. So my class that came in the bicentennial year when I graduated from high school, first year with women, we were the worst ever. You know, you, the weakest class ever. Done okay for ourselves, you know, but, but it's, it's the age old thing. They, these, I, I look down in our formation every day and you kind of, uh, when it, it makes you feel a lot older, but the talent that resides there knocks your Something socks off every day. So we're really, we're still blessed to get extraordinary problem solvers in. They are empowered, to, to Sue's point. You want to come in and solve national security problems? What level do you want to start at? Come on. And, and, uh, and, and I'd like to think uh, we allow for failure. We allow for you to try new things and, you know, uh, come up with, with new solutions. There, there are no cookie cutter solutions that, that we all, that we have handy. Otherwise, we, you know, we, we wouldn't be asking. So um, it's, it, it is, we're lucky to have extraordinary talent still coming in. We need it to keep coming. Um, the other part that was addressed earlier today, we need to track corporate America. Stay close to us. Don't stray. You know, you're comfortable making money in China. How about stay, stay with our national security apparatus as well? Um, and, and we've had some friction here lately where, let me try and explain to you what we were after. We were after the most precise form of warfare ever conceived, so it's absolute targeting, zero collateral damage. W w what's wrong with this approach? Unless, and some of them do, or naively uh, uh, leaning this way, there's never ever a good reason to go to war. I probably can't convince you of the value of this, but otherwise the intelligence we're pursuing, the, the accuracy we're pursuing is to literally have the most accurate way of doing this, which is consistent with our American values, right? Otherwise, carpet bomb, a familiar term that came up a couple years ago, antithetical to the way we, the way we do things. And, and, and I'd just say, although great power competition and kinetic warfare will always be there, we are living in a world of all kinds of small crises, mm -hmm. friction points all around the world where the best solution is not a gun, it's a brain. And, uh, and to bring people in who seek to move around the world, uh, who seek to learn other languages, who mm -hmm. seek to understand micro regions uh, so that the actions that we take are, are more likely to have a predictable effect. Uh, they are as important uh, to the intelligence community and to the military community as those who, who want to be the first through the door with a gun. Okay, we have time for just one or two questions, and I'm going to try to start with a student back here. My name is Ben McNally. I'm a senior here at UT. Uh, with the proliferation of third offset technologies in the context of a strategic environment of renewed great power conflict, how do you see the team of teams approach to C4ISR that SOF pioneered being applied to the conventional forces and the broader national security apparatus? Oh, Tony, that's all yours, buddy. <laughs> current. Wow. The current. 
Yeah, I, 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 I have to take a couple seconds to unpack that. So you're asking how, how we need to adjust in terms of C4ISR relative to the emerging threats? Okay, you got a thumbs up. But, uh, um, as aggressively, as iteratively as possible, um, because right now we, we are a little bit stuck in the current war we're fighting. We acknowledge that most of that isn't fungible to a peer competitor. So the ISR we're flying right now, in fact, when it goes in the wrong places in Syria, it gets shot down. Where, where, we're not, where we not, have not uh, you know, coordinated uh, our particular ISR. It won't, it won't survive in even a Korea scenario, much less a China-Russia scenario. So just the, the, the dependency on traditional ISR over the last 17 years, you need to completely whiteboard that one, figure out where we're swarming, stealthy, et cetera, going forward, uh, you know, a, a confederation of sensors like we've never done before, which is ironically how the Chinese are approaching it. Everything's a sensor. Everything's going into a, you know, and the blended database is time now with facial recognition and everything else they can throw on the top of it. We're not there. We're, we're behind. We need, to, we need to pick it up. Right here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jillian Schrader. I'm a senior here at UT in an undergraduate program, and I'm also an undergraduate fellow with the Clemens Center. And I will be commissioning next year with Air Force ROTC as well. So I would awesome. like to say thank you to the panel for your service. Thank you. My question is actually about autonomous warfare, um, as this is a conversation on threats to the United States uh, national security. Um, I heard it mentioned a couple of times with the panel. Um, we talk a lot about cybersecurity, mm -hmm. cyber threats, but we haven't really been talking about as much um, autonomous warfare. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what are the consequences and risks of the United States developing this technology? But also, what, is it, what are the risks if we don't? So I'll take, I'll take a piece on the, on the threat side. Um, one of the things I think we haven't done as a nation as well as we might on the autonomous side is uh, the security and the assurance of machine learning, artificial intelligence, all those things. Um, if you think about the cyber threats and the ability to get into our systems, imagine being able to mess with the data or the algorithm and just do something slight and small that allows us to draw a different conclusion. And when you couple those things together, I think that leads to some pretty daunting scenarios. So if I would choose one thing that we have probably as a collective underinvested in is what I'll call AI assurance or AI security. And there are a whole bunch of things that go with that, privacy, civil liberties, attention to all those sorts of things. But if we don't get that piece right, the potential, and we proliferate the technologies that allow us to do things autonomously, the potential for either error or mischief would dominate. So if I were to choose one that I think is a really rich area for academic research um, as well as investment uh, between the government and the private sector, I think it would be artificial intelligence assurance. I'll take a leap on the offensive side. Um, and I, I usually um, um, am very uh, self-critical that I'm stunted. I can't say, I'm not the futurist. I'm not the visionary. I come to Austin to <laughs> run around with a bunch of visionaries who make me think. Um, but for this particular approach, I'm not spooked by Skynet. I'm not sp spooked by where people are going. I perversely think it might produce the greatest deterrent capability for state-on-state -state conflict ever envisioned, where you can take down my satellites, you can knock out my infrastructure, I will still have the capability to come hunt and find you and do what I have to do to survive. Does that describe the futility of warfare sufficiently among state actors? You know, you still have to deal with non-state actors and, and others, but uh, it might be the new mutually assured destruction. You know, with, with layered in nuclear aspects as well. Uh, I'm comfortable going there. That, and unfortunately, again, the adversary's already going there, so you have to compete. But I think if you get to a level, boy, this is futile. You actually have autonomous systems that even if I knock out your nerve centers, knock out your C4, et cetera, you can still come at me? Mm. Why are we spending all our money on this stuff? And I'm, I am literally talking myself out of a job when I say that. <laughs> but I'm comfortable that that's where it could go as opposed to being spooked by the robots that have taken over. My colleague from, or friend from the New York Times, Eric Schmidt. Uh, this is for, uh, for General Thomas. Thank for all the panelists hey, today. General, I was wondering if you could help us give a, an assessment of the great power competition on the African continent, specifically the military challenges that, that China and Russia are posing there today. Um, again, a, a, pretty, a pretty complex question. And I think, as you know, and as you've written extensively about it, um, our uh, historic focus, last decade or so, has been almost exclusively counterterrorism because of, because of the draw and because of the sanctuary uh, that, that several groups enjoy there. 
Um, there has been, you know, you know, an absolute realization that it is a great power uh, competition area. Uh, interesting when you talk about information opportunity, information uh, operations opportunities. Um, we just touted this one as an ironic but not exploited opportunity. The Chinese are throwing money all over AFRICOM, ostensibly as the supporter of the Islamic faith, building mosques, building etc. It's you, know, you, you name it. In, in many countries where we're having to compete with the monetary aspect, but also the tied to a spiritual, you know, a, a compelling linkage. We are giving China a complete pass for the penal colony they're running in Western China with the Uyghurs. It's one of the most oppressive things on the planet. And uh, 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 interestingly, after we talked about this, three days later, the BBC trotted that out, and other, others have glommed onto it. But you talk about you know, competing simultaneously, uh, or the acknowledgment that China and Russia are there. China and Russia are in Djibouti in a big way right now. They own a huge uh, naval base that uh, is defying the sovereign power there. They're throwing money at a lot of other places. Uh, they are competing pretty aggressively on that continent. And so it's complicated, a, a CT approach with a, with a broader, you know, with a broader outlook uh, that, that requires some, some pretty deep strategic uh, considerations. What about the Russians? Uh, in Libya, uh, extensively, uh, you know, certainly trying to seize the spoils, um, you know, of, of, the, of the coalition activities um, that, uh, that unfortunately have not solved the civil war there, but uh, absolutely active. They're, they're very active. The question was about the Russians. This is going to be our last question, and I'm going to use my prerogative as a moderator to say it's going to come from a student. So does a student have a question? There's one in the back there. Thank you for being here. Uh, I wanted to place a question in particular for General Thomas in regards to China's influence in South America, particularly Venezuela, and their uh, great presence in their oil industry. What kind of interest would the American military have um, in having any influence, especially the current political situation over there, um, in regards to or in conflict with uh, China's great influence, and what repercussions could that have? Yeah, if I understand the question, is what, what are our military interests in either a stable or a uh, Chinese-affiliated uh, Venezuela? I, I actually have to start by giving the Chinese props. What was the, most uh, what was the latest, most visible thing they did in Venezuela? They pushed their, they pushed their hospital ship in there, uh, much like our US Comfort, uh, that has done great things for us around the world, but very visibly, uh, they're, the, they're the benevolent organization that's coming to deal with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Venezuela's uh, challenges in terms of refugees and, and medical challenges. So they're playing a broad front there, um, you know, b both they and Russia. Um, in, our, in our backyard, as much to be provocative as maybe with a longer-term goal that, that we haven't even perceived yet. But uh, so uh, um, premature for any, milita you know, any military kind of, uh, you know, uh, policy concerns on our part other than, you have a very, you know, you know, very challenged state um, that is, is barely propping itself up, and now you have actors who we don't necessarily consider, consider to be benevolent uh, in there shoring it up. We've seen this movie before elsewhere, so. And I'll just jump in to say that their presence is real. What they offer to these nation states is real, right? It's, it's money for ports and things that they need. The, the problem that it presents that we try and expose is the longer term ramifications of the debt load that you have or the fundamental loss of the sovereignty or the power of the nation because you've basically sold yourself to someone who offered you something very real. There's also the piece of power projection, but there's that more insinuation into a society and over time undermining the nation's ability to have its own resources because they will have sold the debt to another nation state. So it's a fascinating, it, it is a very complex challenge because it is both real and beneficial and deleterious. I'd just like to uh, wrap this up by thanking the panel. And this has been a, a real treat to have this distinguished panel put together and, and I know how busy everybody up here is. And so we greatly appreciate the time you've taken to come, come see us. And could you join me in thanking them for their time? <laughs>